November 18th, 1942, above Henderson Field, Guadalcanal. The hands of an unnamed Japanese Zero pilot tightened on his control stick as he watched the strange, twin-boomed American fighters climbing from Henderson Field. On this date, pilots of the 339th Fighter Squadron became the first lightning pilots to attack Japanese fighters, marking a historic moment that would shatter Japanese assumptions about aerial superiority. Twin-engined, twin tails, climbing like nothing we have seen, he would later report to his squadron commander at Rabol, words that revealed the first cracks in three years of Japanese air dominance. Through his canopy, he had just witnessed something that contradicted everything Japanese naval aviation doctrine had taught. American P-38 Lightning Fighters, those peculiar twin-boomed aircraft that Japanese intelligence had dismissed as heavy and clumsy, had climbed from sea level to combat altitude faster than his Mitsubishi A6M20 could match. In China, in the Philippines, over Pearl Harbor, the Zero had reigned supreme. No Allied fighter could match its climb rate or maneuverability. Yet here, above this blood-soaked island, American pilots in their twin-engined fighters were dictating the terms of battle from altitudes the Zero struggled to reach. The P-38s from the 339th Fighter Squadron claimed three Japanese aircraft during this first combat engagement, executing attacks from heights that rendered the Zero's legendary turning ability useless. The mathematics of aerial supremacy were being rewritten not in dogfighting manuals, but in the stark reality of superior altitude performance that would soon demolish every assumption Japanese pilots carried about their invincibility, their aircraft and their enemy. The Rising Sun's Confidence The collapse of Japanese air superiority had begun long before that November day, though no one in the Imperial Japanese Navy would have believed it. Since December 7, 1941, Japanese naval aviators had swept across the Pacific with an aura of invincibility. The Mitsubishi A6M0, with its incredible range, tight turning radius and trained pilots, had earned a fearsome reputation. The Zero's maximum speed of 332 miles per hour at its critical altitude seemed impressive, and its ability to turn inside any Allied fighter made it deadly in traditional dogfights. Among the elite pilots was Petty Officer First Class Saburo Sakai, holder of multiple victories, veteran of the China campaign, survivor of countless engagements. By 1942, Sakai had achieved 13 victories in the Borneo campaign alone before being transferred to Leh, New Guinea, where he would score the majority of his eventual 64 claimed victories. His confidence, like that of his fellow pilots, was absolute. Lieutenant Junichi Sasai, Sakai's immediate superior, had addressed his pilots before combat operations. The American fighters over the Guadalcanal area are known to have come from aircraft carriers supporting the invasion. They are probably regular American Navy fighters, not Army planes. The Japanese pilots expected to face carrier-based F-4F Wildcats, aircraft they had defeated before. The early months of 1942 seemed to confirm Japanese superiority. Japanese pilots shot down obsolete Brewster Buffaloes over Singapore, decimated Curtis P-40 Warhawks over Java, and swept aside British hurricanes over Burma. The Zero had nearly complete initial dominance in the Pacific theatre. Even when facing newer Allied fighters, Japanese pilots maintained their psychological edge through superior training and tactics refined over years of combat in China. But intelligence reports filtering back to Japanese squadrons in mid-1942 spoke of a new American fighter, something different. Twin engines, twin tails, heavy armament concentrated in the nose. The reports were dismissed by most squadron commanders. How could a twin-engine fighter possibly threaten the nimble Zero? Japanese naval doctrine, built on the concept of the decisive battle and individual combat skill, had no framework for understanding what was coming. The Lightning Emerges the P-38 Lightning was the only really successful twin-engine daytime fighter of the war, the result of Lockheed's response to a February 1937 U.S. Army Air Corps specification for a long-range interceptor. 
Designer Clarence Kelly Johnson and his team had created something unprecedented. A fighter that could exceed 400 miles per hour, climb to 40,000 feet, and carry enough fuel for missions exceeding 1,000 miles. The P-38's twin Allison V-1710 engines, each producing 1,150 horsepower with turbo supercharging, gave it performance characteristics that seemed impossible to Japanese engineers. While the Zero had been designed for maximum maneuverability with minimum weight, even lacking armor protection and self-sealing fuel tanks in early models, the Lightning represented a different philosophy entirely – speed, altitude, firepower and survivability. The first P-38s arrived in the Pacific Theater not with fanfare, but with mechanical problems. When the first P-38s arrived in Australia, they were discovered to have some design problems, and their combat debut was delayed. But by late 1942, these issues were being resolved, and experienced pilots from P-40 squadrons were transitioning to the new fighter. The 49th Fighter Group was still equipped with P-40s, but would soon transition to the Lightning. These pilots brought with them hard-won experience against Japanese fighters. They had learned, often through fatal trial and error, never to engage a Zero in a turning fight. The P-38 would give them the tool to fight on their own terms. First Blood Over the Solomons November 18, 1942, marked the Lightning's first major engagement with Japanese fighters when pilots of the 339th Fighter Squadron, flying from Henderson Field on Guadalcanal, engaged Japanese aircraft while escorting Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress bombers. The results stunned both sides. Japanese pilots flying escort for their bombers first spotted the strange, twin-boomed silhouettes climbing from the south. Their initial reaction was confusion. Were these bombers? Reconnaissance aircraft? The rate of climb suggested neither. By the time they recognized them as fighters, the P-38s had already gained a 5,000-foot altitude advantage. The P-38s would patrol above the altitude at which the Zero could effectively operate. Their great speed at high altitudes allowed them to maneuver into the most advantageous positions, then the big fighters would plunge from the sky to smash into the hapless Zero fighters. The mathematics were stark. While the Zero's low-speed maneuverability was legendary, its high-speed maneuverability was actually inferior to the P-38 at altitude. Above 250 miles per hour, the Zero's controls became increasingly heavy. Above 300 miles per hour, the aircraft became difficult to maneuver at all. The P-38, with its hydraulically boosted controls in later models, maintained effectiveness even in high-speed dives approaching 500 miles per hour. The technological chasm. The shock for Japanese pilots went beyond mere performance numbers. The P-38 represented a fundamentally different approach to aerial warfare that Japanese military culture had not anticipated. The Lightning's armament, 4.50 caliber machine guns and one 20 mm cannon concentrated in the nose, delivered devastating firepower in a focused stream that didn't require the complex gun convergence calculations of wing-mounted weapons. The turbo-supercharged engines were equally revolutionary to Japanese understanding. The P-38's turbo-superchargers made it one of the earliest Allied fighters capable of performing well at high altitudes, while also muffling the exhaust, making the P-38's operation relatively quiet. Japanese pilots often didn't hear the P-38.